We are live. Invite to join. Guys, welcome. Welcome to the first of East Pack East series of Black History Month lives. Um, today I'm going to be talking to Yomi Adegoke, my absolute all-time fave. Where what? is she? There you are! Hello! Hey! How You're you right. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm not going to lie. The technology is kind of like, <laughs> it's got me panicking a little bit. So yeah, other than that though, I'm just, how are you? I'm okay, you know. I'm doing as well as I can in this whole lockdown <laughs> Crankum, crankum. Well, I'm actually suffering, yeah, but I put my lashes on today and I was like, do you know what? I'm going to have a good day. At least you did, because literally this is why I've got like, as you can see, like a hat, glasses. I really just like... The skin. Girl. The skin, <laughs> the skin is skinning. Knowing that I would not be having any makeup. I need, uh, bro, if I'd have just, I was trying to get into the mind frame of doing something, but yeah, look, look at even how dark it is as well. Like I did my best, guys. Right. Don't worry, everyone turn up the, the brightness on the screen. That can be fixed, you know what I mean? Like, we can do that at home, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, oh, so thank you so much for joining. Like, oh my, you. you know, I absolutely stand you. I love you so much. It's so good to just have you here talking about all things diversity in media, particularly journalism. So for the folks who, you know, live under a rock, I don't know who you are. Tell them. Tell them who you are. Or all seven billion of them, child. <laughs> I'm like, who knows who I am? But thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so my name's Yomi Adego K. I'm a journalist. Um, I primarily write for um The Guardian. I do a lot of like um column and opinion writing. So I have a weekly column at the guardian where i write about reality tv completely non-ironic and although i'm saying this like you don't know shante like as if we don't but like for the sake of the viewing yes i what i write a weekly reality tv column for the guardian a monthly column at the ipaper and a monthly series at british <laughs> yeah, and i wrote them. <laughs> Uh, very like, I can't remember what's Lane. Okay, okay. Asterisk, you know, like, you're real like, throwing it in there. <laughs> but um, you're obviously doing incredible stuff in the media space, like, and it's, it is like we have to admit it's, it's because of the work that you've done and the opportunities that you kind of kind of created for yourself. You've also created a landscape where other Black women can start to write about things that don't necessarily have to always be about race or just feel even confident and seen in journalism so we love you for that but for just just to ease us into it for you what does it kind of mean to be a black woman in the uk today and how do you feel about media as a black woman in the uk oh shante it's a it's it's bittersweet as so much of the black british female experience is it's a tale of two city it's a game mm. of Hobbs. um i don't know like i really honestly appreciate what you said about the fact that like i have been very much working for us to be able to write about our experiences um you know in their multitudes which mm. often i mean they're entirely informed by our identity as black women but aren't always directly about that that being said it does really frustrate me that i see a surge of brilliant black writing when particular incidents happen and i wish that that was you know what i mean the energy for that continued consistently throughout the year so like i'm always saying that i am very very tired of it being like there's been an enormous atrocity mm. like black journalists whose pictures we've been ignoring 364 days of the year and then suddenly it's like the scramble do you know what i mean I, i'm always like scramble for africa it's fully just like who is you know what i mean it's very long and it's very draining and also i think like if, it, if it's not that it's like oh okay this film's come out and we need a black mm. perspective because it's about the black experience this album's come out this work's come out and it's very much like a scramble and and it's frustrating because we need to be those voices in those spaces but that that energy needs to continue throughout the year so it's um it's bittersweet because on, on one hand i'm very happy to see more of us doing what we need to do i'm just very mm. tired 
you know what I mean? White journalists, or, do you know what I mean? Being able to write about, uh, considered experts on absolutely anything, and we're only considered experts in our experience. Exactly. And that's the thing as well, because even like last year, I saw a lot of particularly black writers tweeting things like, I've never been asked to interview a white person before, or I've never been asked to interview a white artist before. And I was like, oh my God, when I think about it, of all the interviews I've done, I've never been asked to interview a white person or a white wow. artist. Or this is why when doing this thing, don't. I was saying this on another Instagram live. I was gooped when I was asked to interview Dua Lipa, like who is obviously one of the bi the biggest white girls, <laughs> if not girls who stop stop at the moment. She's doing her thing. I have a lot of time for her, and I was genuinely gobsmacked that I was asked because I just felt I've had the pleasure and the honor of interviewing incredible black women, and I would never change that. But I was amazed and very happy that I was asked because I thought I really did not think that I'd be I'd be in the running for that. So yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like it does feel a bit like you'll get white journalists interviewing black people all the time, but does it spin the other way? I'm not entirely exactly. sure. Yeah. But then how do we how do we solve that? Because I feel like as writers, we will we will pitch whatever, any ideas that we have or people we're interested in, but it's like it's, as soon as it gets to the editor, as soon as it gets to the media organization, they don't want to hear it. So it's like what what do these organizations essentially need to do to get more black writers writing that stuff? And if those writers aren't ready, how can they better prepare them to do those sorts of interviews? You know what I definitely think. So the onus is absolutely on the commissioning editors, that's for sure. And I think mm. making a dis like a really distinguished effort to try and get diverse diversity within diversity, as I like to call it, in terms of like yeah. looking at not just having diverse diverse voices, rather speaking to specific issues and having diverse voices just, you know, essentially being considered business as usual, just like permeating every sort of um, you know, vertical website, all kinds of like coverage and stories that being said i always say to especially upcoming um minority journalists that we should not self i don't know what they pigeonhole <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know what i mean we should not fence ourselves in because i do think that because we are so accustomed to only being commissioned to write about certain things it can mm -hmm. be like this thing has happened i don't even know if i have an opinion on it but I will formulate one knowing I'll get commissioned on it. And it kind of, it kind of gets an already pre-existing toxic attitude that commissioners have, which is that like, you're black, you will talk about this. When I look back at when I first started writing, I was really writing about whatever cropped into my head. Like, I remember I had this whole article dedicated to like Harry Styles' hair and how I was like, oh, he set this trend. This is when I was like 20. And I was like, you can set this, no, I think I was even 19. I was like, look at Harry Styles' hair, like he's really, I was just like looking at boy bands and talking about how they all had this hairstyle. It made no sense. It was like, it didn't really speak to anything, but it was what was going on in my mental mind at that time. And I just, yeah. and I think like, like when I look back at most of my original writing, a lot of it was about race because I'm black and a lot of it was mm -hmm. about feminism because I'm a woman, but lots of it was, I, my first commissioned ever piece for, um, the Independent was about Ask FM. Like, do you know what I mean? The other one was about um, something else completely unrelated. So I think it's about us also not falling into the trap that is being set. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because now we're almost seeing the same things happening, but in the world of publishing. So even kind of beyond journalism in the world of publishing, we're, we're, we're kind of still seeing a lot of like very talented writers being pigeonholed to just write about specific things. But obviously Slain Your Lane is not an anti-racist book it's not about teaching white people to not be racist or anything like that it is very much for by us for us absolutely so for people who want to do that like you know what was the journey what was the inspiration behind that book and you know how did you make sure that you had an idea and it, you weren't going to be controlled into writing something that was about teaching white people to not be racist basically right so i feel like and that's the thing because i think it's a really interesting and and valid in many ways conversation in terms of like what black people are allowed to write and not allowed to write and I think on the one hand we like that's a, that's a valid conversation but on the other hand it's like we want to be able to I don't know like I feel like it's interesting because publishing is very much a bandwagon industry I always say it's like fast fashion where like if one thing hit the catwalk and has thrived then it's gonna be pulled and it's gonna be like you know emulated in other ways but I think what what concerns me sometimes is that I don't want works that are you know, all these works are valid, but you know, works that are genuinely doing something different, but just by virtue of focusing on race, being put into that category, do you get what I mean? Or lumped into, lumped into, because even sometimes it's staying in, I'm like, 
oh my god we were talk talking to the girls like you know we, yeah. this is, this is, do you know what i mean but it could feel like oh okay it's in this category and i'm like i we fully just wrote it because we're like you know i guess we i know it's so like it's such a thing to say but we truly wrote the book that we wanted to read out there like Elizabeth was reading Lean In and like she was reading I'm always like Elizabeth was reading because child I'm actually reading like that <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better but honestly I could be better read <laughs> in terms of like the whole kind of like, you know I think it's like not quite self-help genre but like the genre of bettering your shit and this is when we were like graduates so Elizabeth had read like Girl Boss, Lean In, Thrive by Emma Huffington and she was just like, none of these really, I can't, I can relate to like a percentage, but there's a whole other world that is just not being touched in, tapped into. So she was like, she's the right. She fully was like, you are an author, go, not even an author, you're a writer. Go and write this book for me. And I was like, sis, like, I, I don't even know what I'm doing in life. So I can't advise anybody because I don't even know what I'm doing. So we were like, let's go and find these incredible black women who do know what they're doing. And that's literally how it came about. Um, and it's interesting, I guess, in terms of how publishing works, because we were very, very cautious in terms of trying to make sure that, like, we didn't, you know, that it was, that it was something that was necessary and needed. And we really did our research and we're very much like, OK, you know, there's, of course, room for everybody, but we wanted to make sure it was mm. distinct. We were speaking to who we were speaking to. So, yeah, it really was just like we say it's the love child of exasperation and optimism because, like, we were stressed and tired and we just wanted we we felt that black female readers deserved better and we tried to mm. do that yeah god six years no five oh, shit what year again we're in 2021 so six years ago it was 2015 when we first had the conversation oh my days. yeah man it's mad a long time ago gosh these things they take ages though but it's like you just persevere and you have to be dedicated to it like you have to, yeah, and absolutely and I think as what it looks like you just kind of like I think now like obviously because because black books or books by black authors because I don't even know if, they're, if black books is the correct term but like books by black authors are now very much like a trending thing so now I feel like the turnaround's a lot quicker but back then it was truly just like you know you have the idea in 2015 you've got an agent in 20 same year we got the deal in 2016 but it didn't come out till like 20, 2018 it was like really quite like a four-year journey or something my maths is and all that so <laughs> But that's a really good point you make about kind of this whole sudden burst of everyone kind of suddenly being really interested in black writers, particularly and black people within the media space. Yeah. But it's it's still so fleeting. And I just I wonder like what what is it that organizations should be doing to make sure that they are, you know, diverse and not mm. just diverse for Christmas, diverse for yeah. all the time. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. I think it's so hard because I feel like I mean it's it's not hard in practice but it's hard to I think it's hard to really dig into what people are doing wrong because people will always look at it and be like this is better than where we were two years ago three years ago so people will be like oh wow you know we've managed to get like this black person and they're right like like th we've got this black person and they're writing about this black thing that's better than when we had zero black people writing about zero black things so I think for me it is just about us being able to work and navigate the industry as white journalists would be able to do, which is truly being able to write about anything. Like, you know, truly being able to permeate any space as a writer. Like there's a black food critic whose name escapes me. But I remember when I was like first getting into journalism, I was just like upset. I, I, I'm not even someone who's like, oh, you know, food food criticism or whatever is like something I'm into. But I was, in, I was amazed because I was like, look at this guy, like really just, writing about food <laughs> like do you know what i mean like like just like everybody else i truly loved it i thought it was, i thought it was incredible and it blew my mind and i feel like what organizations need to be doing is just understanding that i think the guardian hats off to them really did this when like i first came on to them i came on board as the women's columnist like two, maybe nearly approaching two years ago and i remember that like when when that conversation was had it wasn't like you are the black woman's columnist. Like, yeah. just in the same way a white woman's whiteness inflicts and impacts, even though we don't see it that way, impacts how mm. they, do you know what I mean? Write about white women, or women's issues generally. They were just okay. like, you're a, you're a woman, your blackness is going to impact it, write about what you want. But like, we're not going to sit here and be like, this is, you know, this is the black woman's column. This is just the woman's column. And the woman's columnist happens to be black. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like roles like that, like just allowing us to write. If 
if there are black people that feel specifically moved to write just about race i saw a role going for a race correspondent at the independent i have i'm not mad at it i saw some people being like yeah. oh, I'm, not, I'm not mad at it. i'm like if you want to write about that's totally fine but not everybody's on that so i think it's about exactly. you know what i mean hiring a black person or a non-white person the race correspondent role sure but what about your features editor what about your mm-hmm. you lifestyle like assistant or whatever so yeah mm. i'm also finding that like literally just just by virtue of being someone who is black and and has opinions you are automatically labeled as a race expert and sometimes i get approached by people being like you know because you talk about this can you give a comment i'm like there are people who dedicate their lives to this stuff right books on this stuff there are people who are turning yeah. themselves to planes at heathrow airport like you need to talk to those people not me and it just it mm. makes it very difficult because it puts a lot of black people who maybe artists into positions where they are being questioned as if they're policy makers simply because they're yeah. black and it is yeah. like i just find that so wild absolutely it's crazy and i feel like it's wild and it's dangerous because i think you, we are very aware of the idea that not all women are feminists totally understood we all get we're all comfortable with that like you know i mean are we actually though because then you'll get people being like but margaret thatcher was a feminist and like you know what i mean it's like n- not really but you know what i mean i like, we are still even in that context still like debating like whether just being a visible woman with power makes you inherently feminist which you know people have sensed no it doesn't but it's still a debate so i think we're even behind when it comes to like being a like like black people understanding that not all black people are a like race experts but even be like anti-racist like yeah we've seen that you know what i mean we've got a whole government filled with like back-to-back like um Kemi Bader Knox and Preeti Patel's like do you know what I mean we understand that you can be um a non-white person and be very much pushing for white supremacy and and, and o- operate in that space so I think yeah it's it's dangerous it's lazy um but I think as well it puts an unfair onus on people who really are just often trying to live and pay their bills and do what exactly. they need to do to get paid um that all that being said I, i'm i'm offensive i'm always like oh on the other hand one thing that when i was at work actually like if, if you feel comfortable with it when i was working at channel 4 news um i had a fantastic boss who was like super open-minded and <laughs> i guess in that kind of almost guilty like all like not guilty white person way but kind of like was a bit like okay here's this thing here's this headline here's this you know video we're doing i don't know if you want me to ask you about whether this is the way to say this thing but i would almost rather ask you than put this out and then it's culturally insensitive and i actually felt yeah, like yeah fine i don't mind being asked because i'd honestly rather that like this is just me though p- p- completely personal to me i'd rather that that conversation was had rather than it goes out it's a H&M cheekiest monkey in the jungle scenario and everyone's like, Yomi, oh. you know what I mean? So yeah, I think it's yeah. a different hat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I think being asked about something and like as a, not as a consultant, but as someone who maybe knows more about something and, and can see if something's culturally insensitive exactly. is like kind of different to being like, to, to Stormzy, like what do you feel like mm-hmm we need to do it what should be in the next race relations exactly. act do you know exactly. what I mean? exactly there are levels to this shit absolutely that like there there are there are gradients to it and i think very often we see we do get a bit more you know jeremy paxman doing uh mr rascal when he came when he came to ask his rascal about i can't even remember if that was the riots or whatever the hell went down there we yeah, didn't see a lot. That. that was a mess and that was like the primordial goop from which so much of this discourse has spawned and madness has spawned because that was years ago and like that whole kind of culture has continued where we're seeing like i don't know a musician or like an artist or just a random person being asked about like do you know what i mean like the stephen lawrence inquiry it's just not ever that time unless they're putting themselves forward in that way but i do i do think that like a very important part of diversity whether it's in the media or anywhere is just D- difference of experience i think there's genuine value in that because it means that people can speak to different experiences and hopefully avoid like pepsi um campaigns with Kevin jenner essentially 100 <laughs> percent. and also like just like amongst black people there is so much diversity do you know what i mean like there's this exactly. like you know there are black people who are middle class there are black people who aren't black people who you know are you know actually from like portugal or whatever do you know what i mean so sometimes i feel like they're 
there can just be this sort of like you just get one black person they represent all of the black people even though we're not monolithic but we have different experiences <laughs> exactly but it, it, i just how, how do organizations who are very white like top to bottom who don't have any sort of idea of how you know they accurately do diversity how do those organizations create content that does reflect the interests of of black people essentially as in without black people there because i was gonna say they can't no, like, it's like, <laughs> like just period like after hiring them what next oh the thing that we see, particularly in media like you know they we get they get loads of black people in they do their diversity yeah 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 teams, they get all the black people in but then as soon as it gets to the higher levels they're oh all the in. oh okay yes absolutely vogue is the British Vogue is the absolute, in my mind, framework for how this shit needs to be done. I mean, mm. I have worked at so many different uh, media organisations where it was actually at one point a running joke and not even just amongst the minority staff that, like, if you saw, like, a lot of young ethnic people in the office, it was like, oh, apprentices are in. Inter it was truly, like, do you know oh, what I mean? No. no. It was known, and that's so mad because it's like, the, like I think one of the reasons in many newsrooms I felt like the youngest, even if I wasn't, is because I was very often the youngest person and like only minority that was in a like, what's the word, permanent position and a full time role. Like most people in many newsrooms I've worked in, it was either like, okay, you know, we've got this freelancer in on like, you know, however many month contract we've got, like an intern, we've got an apprentice, apprentice, and I think the reason that Vogue have been able to like implement the changes that they have has been because of who is where and in what role and yeah. I'm, I'm even thinking like you know even with a very diverse I mean not only are there like staff writers and stuff diverse but then you've got the amazing Vanessa Kingori you've got the amazing Edward Enenfall in roles that are really able to implement change and I'm like they are they are in these positions which don't just allow them to think let's have like black writers write to their experiences that is what the only reason that i was able to interview do lipa is because there are two black people in my in my mind and, and the thing is as well like also white people in that office like i mean vogue has obviously got a, a reputation of being quite like you know elitist and, and 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 you know like up there and it's and it's obviously like considered like the the creme de la creme but there is definitely a i would say understanding that you don't have to be a particular type of person to write about particular things because I yeah, it's interesting because Vogue that's probably one of the only places and maybe the Guardian to an extent actually that have actually allowed me to or not allowed because it's not like I've been told no it's just more have thought to have me write about other things and it's the same way that the Guardian I write, I write about reality TV like yeah. it's not like I'm writing about Zeus Network and you know love on um, hip hop it's like I'm also writing about all reality TV across the board and I think it's about mm. if people are in those positions to make it happen yeah yeah and are, other than kind of vogue in the guardian are there any other organizations that you feel are kind of doing diversity in media extremely well oh in media oh my god i have to i mean it's not really an organization in terms of like as a platform but the charity arts emergency of which i'm a trustee mm -hmm. incredible i do not just say that because i'm a, trust, a trustee like it's the way they think of diversity and what I think is so important about them also like shout out to creative access as well they're obviously getting lots yeah. of like young minority people into the industry but the thing about arts emergency that I really appreciate is that they think about um diversity in terms of race and class and ability but also race and class and ability all together if that makes sense so they're people as raw individuals and it's like understanding that you know there are black people and then there are black working class people and then there are white working class people and like understanding those differences and and very much um looking at it accordingly i think they do um amazing stuff but then even then it's like places like galdem like absolutely mm. out, out in the world to that platform because i'm just like they are quite literally creating entire careers and the start of tomorrow i think they're doing absolutely incredible stuff um and live is genuinely next level in terms of like just what she's been able to achieve there and the legacy she has. Um, and oh gosh, in terms of other places, Huffington Post, I'd say just single-handedly because of Nadine White. Like Nadine White yeah, is the a journalist in the world. Like she is doing absolutely, and I really respect the, the platform they've given her there. Um, so yeah, I think that those are the ones that come to head for now. And for people kind of watching this or just watching your platform and your content in general, what would you say to them if they wanted to pursue uh, writing career that has been similar to yours? I would say 
start if you aren't getting the one advice I can say is if you're not getting that traction immediately in terms of like if you're putting your pictures out and you're not getting like the feedback that you need to you need to start something on your own like you actually have to mm -hmm. like the barrier to entry is so low and it's never gonna I personally don't think it will stay this low like you can go on medium you can you know you can like I don't know if they I mean even now I'm like do they still do independent voices am um, I showing my age here I don't know if they even still do that anymore because obviously the independent the independent voices and you could you know pitch and you know I don't even think it was paid <laughs> but you but you got like you know you exit yourself in like a paper at one point and you I feel like we're in a space where almost anybody can get published do you know what I mean so yeah. I feel like if they're even if then you're still getting those no's like you need to put your own writing out there on your on its own because at one point I had no bylines and I was literally sending people to my blog and being like this is where you can do writing so you just have to start I know it sounds very lame to say but you just have to do it yeah yeah, yeah. and if there was sort of one thing that you wish you knew at the beginning of your um journey into journalism what would that have been one thing that I wish I knew that I didn't now oh shit I'm trying to think I had the tea because my sister's a journalist. <laughs> my older sister's a journalist. So I'm like, I knew everything that I didn't know. Me. <laughs> what, what did I actually genuinely wish? That? Um, I guess that, I guess that like freelancing isn't, it's difficult, but it's not something you should be afraid of because I was, mm. I mean, I think many second generation immigrant like household kids or whatever like I have a real thing about money and stability and really was afraid of I was very fearful of yeah not having a stable income and I really I, I want like to have money and be stable and not even in a flexing sense I just wanted to be stable and, and you know what I mean mm. be financially solvent and whatever and I was afraid that if I went freelance I wouldn't be able to do that and having gone freelance like yeah there's absolutely people say all the time you there's the opportunity to earn more um than you do when you're in full-time work that being said as always I was very I very much waited until I was absolutely certain that I would be able to at least break not break even but match what I was earning in my job and it's hard yeah, to yeah. When you're gonna reach that point because you can't really yeah. to gamble so yeah I just wish I wasn't so afraid of freelancing I'd have done it earlier but I'm very happy for the for the um you know experience I got in newsrooms for sure, yeah. I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, I literally just like last October, I, I decided to go freelance and quit my job, and like I moved back home because I was like, do you know what? I'm, I'm unsure about this. That's so, a good idea, though. That's the thing. Like, that's the thing. It's a trade off, and and you know, Vanessa King Gory says this in our book. Like, everything is a trade off, and it's like, okay, you're gonna quit if you're gonna quit your full time job that has a more stable paycheck, then at least there's the acknowledgement of I'm not going to live an identical life to how I was living before let me stay at home and, and, and save on bills so then I can do you know what I mean it's just about I think yeah, yeah really looking at, if you have that option do it I do not understand why people, um, more people don't live at home if they have the option that's me personally mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to save it up man because I was like do you know what I want to do this freelancing thing but I, I don't want to risk it and still have bills to pay so I was like yeah. let me even move back home and uh, it's been all right and plus because we've been in the middle of the pandemic as well i was thinking quit my job in the pandemic are you crazy but honestly like i'm i'm so happy i did it like and i've just had the opportunity to do so much more and i, I do feel a lot more like free and flexible and like writing doesn't have to be something that's sort of like hidden on the side that i'm doing like on the side of my desk like trying not to get in trouble and it's just it's such a nice feeling but yeah. oh, it gets a huge kind of leap of faith to say do you know what i'm actually just gonna commit to doing this um but the future let's talk about the future so what is happening for you next because i know you're not even staying in this this writing thing you're you're coming on the screen you're coming on the screen i've been to the god the future is uh i don't know bruv i'm like the future's bright the future's orange i hope we'll see we'll see it's interesting because i feel like yeah like i guess that's the thing with freelancing like you just it, it, writing for me like I guess it's been it's been very interesting because I've never done anything other than journalism like I've always done journalism but I've done like video journalism I've done like hard news I don't know I thought I was kidding with that but I've done like hard news I've done like you know um what's the other thing like um there's another th like like just did, like been a women's like senior writer and done all these different things and like I think it's now that I've started to realize that like 
a portfolio career or like you know when we talk about like on multi hyphenates and just doing very different things that is to me the future someone yeah. is doing in the next door yeah like i feel like, um that's the future for me so for me it's like yeah like i've definitely been like looking into like tv stuff i've definitely been like looking like i'm trying to write a novel which has just been a process it's been very very interesting it's been honestly interesting it's the only way i can describe it for now we'll see what happens but like yeah it's like i'm doing two different things and like it's them ones as well where it's spooky because you're like what can i even there's some things that i'm like oh there's some things that i'm like everybody keep their eyes out like there's definitely some stuff coming there's other things that i'm like oh i might have to wait on that before i talk about it but like yeah, yeah like i'm doing lots of different things the, the only thing that i keep bringing up is the fact that i'm writing a novel and it's more for accountability because i'm like yeah. then everyone can step on my neck and be like where is it because obviously if not i will drop it at fifty thousand words <laughs> just leave it so yeah there's lots of different things but um i've got a couple of things that i'll be Announcing, I'll be thrilled to announce. Um, soon. <laughs> <laughs> I literally can't wait because honestly, like your writing is incredible. You are incredible, but like to see you on the screen, I uh, want some of that. Your own it's show, a lot. It's a lot. Listen, I, I, like that's the thing is, I do a lot, and that's that's another interesting thing about being freelance is that like I when I was at ITN. I was writing, obviously, and the managing director, I, I think he was the managing director, this guy called Chris Shaw that was, like, quite senior there would always be like, you should get into TV, and I was just like, no. Like, because to me, I was just like, just being goofy doesn't necessarily mean that you are, do you know what I mean? Like, qualified yeah. to be like, because I was just like, I'm just, I don't know if it's for me. I very much like the, like, almost um, anonymity of writing because back in the day, <laughs> I say even though I'm 29, but like back in the day when I was writing, I didn't even have a byline photo. Like it was truly just my name. So people just mm -hmm. like reacting and being racist to my name. But I was like, ah, you don't even know who I am. Whereas now it's like, obviously I'm more and more in the public eye. So it's like, I do a lot of like hosting, but I've done it primarily for like internal events or brands or stuff like that and not necessarily taken to the screen. But yeah, those conversations are happening. So it should be, um, you know, it should be, it should be an interesting, <laughs> an interesting process yeah we'll see how it goes do you know what i mean honestly i can't wait i think it's gonna be sick but i, I do love what you say about kind of like being a multi husbander or having several careers because sometimes i get so anxious that like i just do so much stuff that i don't know what my thing is i don't have a niche i don't have an anything like i will be writing one day and then i will be doing TikTok <laughs> like do you know what i mean like there's no and so sometimes i'm like oh damn like do i need to have a do I, do I need to have a pattern career basically at this point do i need to have the the thing that i'm gonna do or is it okay to consistently just dabble and just see where things take you basically i think i think i think the thing about life and careers is that i genuinely think nine times out of ten everybody lands on something like even if it's one thing they land on something so like i I mean, I studied law. I didn't want to be a journalist. Like, I'm one of the few people I know that wasn't like, oh my God, it's my dream. Like, I didn't. I had a sister who was a journalist. I was like, she's sick. She's doing her thing. But it looks stressful. I was like, I don't really know about this. And then when I, like, got into it, it was like, by virtue of not being able to get a job, basically, as a writer, that's how I ended up mm -hmm. with, like, video journalism. And I look back and I actually lol that, like, I was doing video journalism. So I was like, who do I think... I was because I did not know what the hell I was doing. Like, I actually didn't have a clue. So I'm like, I think, and then I was kind of like, this is interesting. I'm a video, I'm a multimedia journalist at like a very big news station and I'm rubbish at it, but I'm writing these pieces on the side. And then we got our book deal and I was like, tw Elizabeth was 22, I was 23. And at that point, it was like, oh my God, if I can make this work, then I can end up doing just writing for my career. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. That's me set. Then it was like, mm. I wrote the book, and then it's like, I was saying this to my friend the other day, I was like, 90% of the money that I make, I wouldn't even, is it from writing? I mean, a lot of it's from books, but like, a lot mm. of it's from other stuff. So I feel like the things kind of end up, like, I've ended up doing all this random stuff, but then even then, it's still kind of like, I've settled on the things that I know I'm going to be repeatedly doing. So I think it's good yeah. to do, and I think it's good to, to, to experiment, otherwise you won't know if you like it or not um yeah. that being said i actually could never give a straight answer on anything but that being said i also think that like it's good to know that if you're going to an event and they're going to give you a name tag you can say i'm a this just having that thing that you know 
you're still concluding yourself as because at the end of the day, I do bare stuff, but like I still consider myself a journalist first and foremost, just because mm. I think it's good to always have that as not something to fall back on, but just as the thing that I know whatever happens, that's my career. You get what I mean? Yeah. And do you think that you will kind of stay in the UK for the rest of your career? Is there anywhere else you'd want to go and restart? Absolutely. Bruv, I'm like, as much as I absolutely cannot, oh, let me, I was about to say, I, <laughs> I was about to say, I was about to cannot stand this country. I'm like, that, be, like, honestly, as much as like, this is actually one godforsaken island. That, like, honestly, at the same yeah. time, I know, <laughs> I know I'm trying to conquer it. <laughs> like, that's, that's one thing I'm absolutely certain of. But I mean, I'm not really, I don't know, like, my sister's bodying journalism in Nigeria. She's incredible. And she's at BBC Africa. Yeah, and she's, she's sick. Yeah, she's sick. And it's like, but, but I'm not like, where would I go? Like, I can only speak English, barely. So it's like, what am I going to go to? America? I don't want to be in America. And I think as well, I'm very comfortable about, like, I, I don't know, like, I'm not, I'm not like, like America, I totally understand the allure because I'm seeing certain people like London Hughes. I don't even know her, but I've literally watched her journey from like, I've seen her on Twitter before and the way she's killing it in America is inspiring and it truly like makes me happy and I'm always just like oh my god like go you like she's re this country wasn't giving her what she needed but for me I'm like yeah like I don't know there is something about this hellhole where like I'm just like you know what like I feel like there is so much left for me to do that means where am I going do you know what I mean there's just so, I mean was such a like thing and people we still get messages about it how many years later and people being like oh my god it actually changed my life and i'm like god this is one of how many stories that we still have to tell here mm -hmm. and i there's so much do you know what i mean for me to do so i know i will probably be here till like retirement and then i'll like fuck mm -hmm. off to like like every other what that british person does past the age of like 54 then i'll go to like benadorm or something <laughs> For now, I'm like, no, I'm definitely UK. <laughs> we stay in here. And as long we as COVID in. is here, we stay in here. As long as COVID is here, mate, bring on 2030 and then maybe I can think about taking some flights. But for now, <laughs> oh, definitely. Days. Well, how have you been maintaining during lockdown? Like, have you? what has been your routine? How are you staying sane? What is self-care? Self-care? What is self-care? That's such a good question. I'm like... <laughs> Cause I'm like, honestly, what is it? Like, like I've been walking a lot. Like I found a park up my road that I've never seen before. And I was like, oh my God, like how did I miss this? And it, and it was, mm. it just shows the mental space I was in before lockdown, which was just like, I travel, I commute to London and come back. Like I, there was no me walking around. I'd never even noticed there was a, there was a park. So mm. I've like been walking around there and like literally just like walking in circles, listening to um RuPaul's my RuPaul's bangers um Spotify playlist which like makes me feel like I can take over the world and makes me walk really quickly so I've been doing that and like that's my exercise and like um, aside from that like I I got into painting in a big way like in the oh, yeah. yeah I taught myself to sculpt I was really like on it like because I'd never I used to I've always anytime I'm like I taught myself to sculpt I, I sculpt I have to add the disclaimer that like I've always been artistic I've always been able to paint but I mm -hmm. wanted to see if like sculpting was like painting but 3D because I'd never done it before so I had a go and I was like oh it is it's actually the same thing <laughs> um and it was fun and I and I really got into it and then that led to like all these opportunities of like art platforms and art like museums and stuff which again like I never I, yeah, I never thought because I think that's the thing. Like, it's so weird. We're, we're taught to teach. We're kind of taught to be like, this is your brand, and this one like, I do think it's good to experiment because it's like, this is your brand. You write, but painting's always been a very big part of my life. But I don't think mm. people knew because I wasn't posting it. I just was like, yeah, like I, yeah, yeah. It's a private, not private, but it's just not. Just never really thought of putting it out there. Once I put it out there, it's like become a whole new stream of like content and just life and people are like, asking to do things i'm like yeah sure and that was keeping me going but now it's like if it's not married at first sight australia it's which is just the best it's it's the novel <laughs> it's literally just the novel writing the damn book and trying to with my self-imposed deadline it's literally nobody asked me i'm just like yeah i'm gonna write a novel but yeah like that self-imposed deadline is keeping me go and it's keeping me busy and it's keeping me like focused oh my god i'm watching lifetime thrillers i've been watching them because i'm isolating so i live with my sister but my mum came to isolate with us like yeah. oh my god it's a 
in a year. Last March, she came. She's just never left. <laughs> so she's that, never though. left. It's mad. <laughs> she's just here. So like we watch lifetime thrillers. I'm like, she gives her commentary. Her commentary is just like sex. She doesn't even try to be funny, but like her commentary is second to none. So that's been keeping me going. <laughs> she's really, really joking. We need a podcast. We need a podcast. She, I've been saying, I said, get her onto Gogglebox, but then she'll say something and she'll end up getting the whole family cancelled. So I'm like, forget about that because she's a yeah, man. Well, well, well. So you're obviously doing amazing. We're all going to keep our foot on your necks with this novel. Everyone, if you're watching this, as soon as we hang up, I need to go and DM and be like, how's the novel going? Everyone's oh, going. what have I done? What have I done? I'm going to be texting you like, novel, <laughs> making sure everything's going fine. Yeah, I Honestly, it's been so good to just chat with you. Like, you know oh, I'm such a stan. And you are just you. wonderful. Zina's in the comments like, Yomi, can you be my life coach? Can you be my oh, life Oh, Zina, coach? my face! I, I need this. <laughs> I need this energy. Like, it's just so validating. So many of us are experiencing and feeling exactly the same things. And it's not until you kind of sit down and talk about it that you're like, oh, damn, like, we all going through it. Like, all we're the all same. Out. You know what I mean? Face. Absolutely, bro. That's the thing, even with the pandemic, when we're like, oh, we're not achieving. I'm like, babes, no one is achieving. <laughs> no one's doing shit during this period. So we can all relax, for real. Honestly. <laughs> exactly. So um, where can people connect with you? Is it just on the IG? Oh, my gosh. On Instagram, which is this one. I don't even know where I'm pointing, but it should be on this screen somewhere. And then my, it's my Twitter. I'm such an auntie, I don't even know. My Twitter is literally the same, but without the full stop. But I don't be tweeting. I'm literally like, I'm just retweeting. So if you want top quality retweets, find me on Twitter as well. <laughs> but I won't be saying anything. So. Um, I need to be like that, you know, because all I do is tweet myself into scandals. I just need to sit down and... Not it's hard. Again. It's hard. It took me years, probably a decade to get there. So boy, it's not easy. <laughs> not easy at all. Oh, Chile. We got there and then, though. I'm getting better. I'm getting there. I'm learning. I'm growing. Growth. Was that gross? Yes. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much. This thank has been you. a banging conversation. Thank and we are just blessed to have you on this planet, in this crusty London, in this great England. You are just thank, so thank, thank you so much. You know, it's been it's been fun, Ryan. Thank you. It has been. Enjoy the rest of your evening, gal. And I'm gonna save this live so the people can watch it back and hold you accountable. Oh my god, no. <laughs> All right, bye. See you later. <laughs> bye. Ah. <sighs>